Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our talk on the hardware innovations that went into the design of the Xbox Series X. Uh, my name is David Sutherland, and I'm a hardware engineer here on the Xbox team at Microsoft. And I'm joined here today by my, my colleagues and fellow hardware engineers, Andrew O'Dell and Marco Maswa. Uh, I'd like to start off by acknowledging all the truly amazing work that went in to the design of this console. Uh, it really was a team effort from you know hardware to software to services to content. Uh, each of these subject areas could have been their own presentation easily. Um, so we're really only scratching the surface here today, but hopefully uh, this is an interesting deep dive into what, into what went into creating this console. So today we're gonna start off by introducing the product pillars that drove the definition of the Xbox Series X hardware. Uh, then we'll discuss my personal favorite topic, the speeds and feeds that were required for our hardware to meet these aggressive performance goals. And then we'll be uh, diving a bit deeper into some of the trade-offs that resulted from these aggressive performance targets, including the innovative tower form factor, the thermal architecture, and many other system level innovations. So to kick things off, uh, you know, at this, the outset of the Series X program, uh, we knew that we wanted to build the most powerful Xbox ever, and that we wanted to focus on enabling developers to deliver the most incredible gaming experiences possible. Uh, to achieve that goal, we really established three primary pillars for the design of the Xbox Series X. We really wanted to create that most powerful next-gen console with 12 teraflops of GPU power, and, and that, that doubles our, our GPU power from the Xbox One X. And then we wanted to make sure to you know, improve physics, visual fidelity. We wanted to give the most immersive, immersive visual experience possible. Uh, you know, 4K, 120 FPS, we wanted to just cut load times to the minimum. Uh, and then we wanted to make sure that you had the best version of your games, that you had a huge back compat library um, with four generations of Xbox content, and that you were able to you know, harness that power of the Xbox Game Pass and that huge game library so to play all your games. And uh, you know, to kick off that, I'm gonna hand it off to Mark, who's gonna talk about the engine that powers the Xbox Series X, our system on chip. Thank you, David. At the heart of the Series X is the system on chip. This was designed in partnership with AMD and manufactured at TSMC on its seven nanometer process. What's most interesting here is the significant increase in transistor count an almost an over 2x increase in the number of transistors as compared to the Xbox One X. As we go through this presentation, I'd like you to keep that in mind, as this will have a significant impact on the design of the Series X. To the left is a die shot of the Series X sock. I'd like you to keep in mind the location of the different IP blocks, as this too will have a significant impact in the overall design of the system. The memory subsystem on the Series X was designed to run GDDR6 at 14 gigabits per second per pin bandwidth and has a total capacity of 16 gigabytes. An interesting choice was made here, such that 10 gigabytes of memory were dedicated towards game titles and six gigabytes were dedicated towards the operating system. The 10 gigabytes of memory has access to the full memory bandwidth of 560 gigabytes per second, whereas the operating system has access to 336 gigabytes per second. Running GDDR6 at 14 gigabits per second as compared to the 6.8 gigabits per second on the Xbox One S made us think about quite a number of things. We had to think about new PCB materials, a new PCB stack up to ensure that we had good signal integrity on the memory bus. An interesting challenge, too, was power of the, the memory devices. Our initial extrapolations of what we expected from the GDDR6 parts as compared to the GDDR5 parts was completely different from what we saw when we built out the system and started running some tests. Another aspect um, of the system design was the EMI. The EMI, or radiated emissions from the GDDR6, was much more than we had expected during early development. Finally, this whole concept of, of uh, running 10 gigabytes of, of kind of dedicated towards uh, um, game titles and six gigabytes dedicated towards the operating system meant that we had to um, use 
two gigabyte devices and one gigabyte devices, that means or meant that we needed to optimize for both signaling and timing in terms of latency for the different devices. The Series X introduces a generational leap in performance. There is an almost 2x increase in GPU performance, 3 to 4x increase in CPU performance, and a 1.7x increase in memory performance. The 2x increase in GPU performance comes from an increase in the number of CUs or compute units, but there's also a significant increase in the frequencies. On the CPU side, there is an architectural change from the Jaguar cores to the Zen 2 cores, and also a significant uplift in frequency. For the memory bandwidth, as we move from GDDR5 to GDDR6, there is there's an almost 2x increase in pop-in bandwidth. This increase in frequencies, in addition to the significant increase in transistor count, while maintaining an almost equivalent die area to the 1x um, SOC, meant an interesting challenge for system de design. I'll now hand it over to David, who will dive deeper into that. Thanks, Mark. So as Mark alluded to, we're all bound by the laws of physics, and we, none of this performance comes for free. So when you make things go faster and you keep all of it in the same area, your power density goes up. And that's really a challenge for system design. So when we look at things like this three to four X CPU performance generational leap and the seven nanometer process, you know, power goes up. And this is something that as system designers, we think about a lot and really drives the design of the, the console. Uh, and specifically, when we look at electrically powering the console, we have to think about, you know, how do we size that power supply? We got to make sure that it uh, that it has full capacity for your worst case load so that when you you play a game and it does something that's high power, your console stays running. Uh, we also need to think about motherboard power delivery and ensure that every rail meets its peak power requirements. Um, and of course, that power electrically generates heat and that heat needs to be cooled. Uh, so that impacts uh, not just, you know, what you think about the heatsink design, how we put the box together, but the form factor, you know, what's the fan? Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about these kinds of trade-offs. So I'll, I'll hand it off to Andrew, and he's gonna talk more about how we arrived at the form factor. Thanks, David. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, then this picture we're looking at sort of tells the story of the early Xbox Series X development and design. What we're looking at here is some actual uh, early models of the console. And you can see there's various form factors here, different aspect ratios, different shapes and sizes, different venting solutions, maybe a different design language, but most of them look similar to a lot of Xboxes we've seen in, in the past. And one of them is a little bit different and it's the one front and center there, the tower, the one we actually ended up with. Um, I've been involved, I've got a little gray in my beard, I've been involved in the uh, Xbox design for a long time, since, since before the Xbox 360 launch. And in my experience, usually the different form factors, the little weirder ones, don't win out for various reasons. We make, we make trade-offs with mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. We'll go into some of those. But in this particular case, the different console did win out. And the primary reason for that is uh, acoustic performance and thermal performance. The tower form factor just really provided better cooling for the, the cooling challenges we faced with these high-powered internal uh, components, as well as uh, providing better acoustic or performance or a quieter console and a better user experience. So when we think about the tower form factor, uh, we think about how we design the console. The early design, like I said, is an evolutionary iterative process. So electrical engineering, mechanical engineering will trade off with industrial engineering. We might say, you know, can we, we make trade-offs for manufacturability, for cost, for uh, feasibility, for different risks that we want to take or don't want to take or that we can manage. Uh, design language and especially user experience. How is, how is customer going to experience the console? So we might propose, hey, can we grow the console by two inches wider or taller? That really help us solve this thermal solution or this voltage regulator solution. And the ID might say, no, that, will, that won't look right. Or they might come to us and say, can you make it two inches thinner or like a laptop? That would be great. And we'll say, no, that's way too expensive. We can't do that. Or they might do something. Sometimes they come along and say something like, can you make it like a sphere, like a Death Star? And we say, no, we definitely can't do that. But actually, maybe we could. 
Um, but we started this process on this console back in 2017, early 2018. So right after the Xbox One X shipped and two years before we even had silicon for this console. Um, and what we found when we started looking at it was that the tower, the, the thermal simulations and, and models we created showed that the tower would actually be significantly smaller than an equivalent console design. Um, you can see that chart on the right kind of shows what our initial tower concept, how big it was, what the final was, and what our console concepts ended up being when we looked at the thermals were actually quite a bit larger. These other form factors may not have fit so well inside some entertainment centers. Uh, they might have had other challenges. They would have been, and by and large, we think they would have been louder than what we ended up with. So we really made this trade off early on uh, to, to, to manage the acoustics and thermals. Um, I myself was taken aback when we really headed down this path for real. I was taken aback by this tower concept saying, you know, this doesn't look like anything we've ever shipped. Are we making a mistake? And I think a lot of the world was taken aback initially, judged by the, judging by the reaction when we revealed it at the Game Awards and like the internet was full of you know, hilarious memes 30 seconds later with our tower console concept. But this tower console um, really offered some challenges and some opportunities, and we'll talk about uh, those here in the next slide. So one of the big challenges was by going to the tower form factor, we had to split the motherboard into two. Uh, we, and this is new for Xbox. We've always had an atomic motherboard, you know, one big motherboard where all of the firmware and hardware and software lives on one board. It's designed as one unit, tested as one unit, manufactured as one unit. Um, this case, we're splitting it in half. And we split it into the SOC board or system on chip board and the Southbridge board. The SOC board, as we've already talked about, is the heart of the system. It's where the SOC and the memory and the high speed uh, video out and all of the power delivery, the power that beast lives as well as the internal and external SSDs. So if you think this thing looks kind of like a big video card, that's for a reason. It really is a big video card with, with um, some storage on it. And if you look at that picture on the right, you see that you know if you look at the sock and the memory inside that fence and then the voltage regulators right around it, that whole compact unit really sets the size of the box in the horizontal dimensions. Um, that's about as small as we can make it. The Southbridge board is basically a redesign of our existing uh, I.O. boards with uh, USB, Ethernet, radio, et cetera. But one of the opportunities here was uh, by concentrating all the high power and high frequency components on one board, we could target the thermal solution and the uh, electrical solution at that one board, meaning we use uh, more advanced PCB material to handle the higher speed signals just on that board as opposed to the entire system, you know, a larger motherboard. It also meant that we... Uh, to deliver all that power, we had to use extra copper density and extra copper layers to deliver that power. And again, we contain that to just the board that needs it and not the whole system. Um, the resulting solution, though, of how we connect the boards together was a, was a, a long story. Uh, essentially, we had to figure out how these two boards are going to communicate, what's the most efficient and reliable way to do it. And we settled on an 80-pin board-to-board -board connector. And it sounds somewhat obvious in retrospect, but actually we iterated on this for months with the mechanical team and the electrical team, uh, trying different types of connectors, different cable solutions, multiple cables, coax cables, uh, a riser card, uh, rigid solutions. And really this is the one that fell out to be the most manufacturable and the most uh, um, reliable and meet our needs and met our needs. Um, one other thing to consider here is this, how a console gets designed. So the design process for the console, as I mentioned, starts years before we ship and even years before we have working silicon. So we have to do a lot of the design up front using assumptions and working with assumed risks. So we iterated on this design for two years before we ever saw the first silicon. That involved doing things like building thermal load boards, thermal systems that look like this, that perform in a similar thermal manner so that we can validate our models and see if we're actually building the thing we think we're building, as well as high-speed test boards and voltage regulator test boards and different technologies to help us mitigate some of these risks. And then one thing I would add the split board design allowed us to do is to target our EMI, our interference, or electro electromagnetic interference mitigation to one board with those shields around the memory and targeted shields around high-speed circuitry, as well as targeted filter solutions at the interfaces to the other board and the outside world. And our, our compliance and radio teams really helped drive that solution for us early on so we didn't run into any troubles there. And with that, I'll hand it back to Dave to talk a bit about the thermal architecture. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so as we talked about, we built you know a beast of the machine and it has a lot of power. And by splitting the board, we created an interesting new challenge for the Xbox team and how we're gonna tackle this. So we kind of had to rethink the way we approached the thermal architecture of the Series X versus what we had done with the One X or the previous consoles. 
So traditionally you have, you know, the cool air flow in from the sides or the front uh, and then blow out the back. But in this particular case, we basically had all the cool air come in from the bottom of the console or the back of the console, and then it's pulled through the console by the fan and blown out the top. Uh, and, and to break things down a little bit more from there, uh, the way we can think about this is that basically the system is built around a center core. We call it the center chassis. And it can be thought of as kind of like the backbone or the spine of the system, both mechanically and thermally. And we do use it as a heat sink for some lower power components like the Southbridge PCB and some of the things on the backside of the sock board. But really, you know, where, where the thermal architecture really uh, shines is with, with the vapor chamber and with the heat sink. And you can see that all of the hot components are on that side of the board, on the heat sink side of the board. So that's the, the sock, of course. It's the DRAM and the voltage regulators that power the sock. Um, all of those touch off on the vapor chamber. And that allows us to sink that heat very effectively uh, into that heat sink. And then the fan pulls the cool air through and is able to dissipate the heat. Uh, also note that on the other side of the board, kind of the cooler side of the system, we have the, the more sensitive components, you know, the optical disk drive and the PSU. Uh, and those components get cooled by kind of a parallel path of airflow. One other thing we really spent a lot of time optimizing on was the fan itself. So the thermal mechanical team spent months and months optimizing uh, the fan design with our partners, uh, you know, different shapes, different, uh, different uh, number of impellers, um, all kinds of different uh, designs to get us at the maximum airflow for the minimum amount of noise. And another thing that the mechanical team worked on was something that kind of goes overlooked. It, it's called the X spring. It's, it's how we uh, mechanically attach the heat sink to the board because you need to have uh, compressive force there. And we had used the same X spring design for a number of generations and changing that as a result of having to uh, have capacitors on the back of the board, we, we couldn't use the existing design. So we had to completely redesign that. Uh, and it's a bit of risk because that, that component is very, uh, has a lot of impact on the thermal performance of the subsystem. But by redesigning it, we were able to get optimal TIM pressure, so the, the compressive force there, uh, and uh, we're able to put the capacitors where we needed them for power delivery. And one other thing we wanted to, to highlight was uh, before we got hardware, we spent a lot of time in modeling, and this was, you know, doing thermal simulations, doing airflow simulations to try to arrive at a, at a really good design point so that we had to do minimal mechanical iterations. Um, so the team did an amazing job there. Uh, you know, if, if you've had one of these uh, in your house or you've played with one of them, you know how much time we spent optimizing the acoustics and the airflow on this. These things are really, really quiet, and we're, we're super proud of, of how quiet the experience has really been. Uh, a big part of that is, is due to this vapor chamber. Um, and for those that aren't necessarily mechanical engineers, uh, a vapor chamber is, is basically a, a hollow chamber with a vacuum uh, or under vacuum. And inside of that chamber uh, is some water. And what happens is when that one side of that uh, vapor chamber gets hot, uh, the water inside of the chamber vaporizes and flows throughout um, the chamber. And that heat energy from that water vapor is transferred onto the other uh, plate and eventually into the heat sink. And it does a very efficient job at doing this. Uh, and it allows us to achieve a really minimum acoustic profile um, while keeping our our heat sink size down because we could make a giant hunk of aluminum, but then your console would be super heavy and it would be clunky and we wouldn't want that. So that that's why we arrived at the vapor chamber solution. So on the, the other side of the coin here is obviously in order to uh, have something that cool, you need to have power, right? It's kind of thinking of a backward. Um, we wanted to really optimize our power profile for this console because ultimately the, we don't want to have to cool the power. So it'd be great if we just didn't create it in the first place. Um, now that, that doesn't work as well for, for gameplay modes where you're trying to put as much performance as possible into the box, but for scenarios that don't really require the performance, uh, we don't want to be running in max frequencies because it's just wasted power. So we spent a lot of time uh, with the software team, with the firmware teams, and the content folks, 
to make sure that we were running at the optimal frequency uh, for power consumption. So these are for modes like media playback uh, and for our standby modes, instant on and energy saving mode. And, and you can kind of see here, we, we broke it down by um, percentage of SOC power um, versus gameplay. So for media streaming, let's say you're, you're loading up your favorite media app uh, and, and today it's running at about 14% uh, of the sock power of our worst, pay, worst case gameplay power. Um, and this is really a testament to the optimization we did. That This would have been 25% higher uh, had we not done the optimization. And same thing for our standby modes for background download, or sorry, for background download, instant on, and energy saving. Uh, all of those modes um, were meticulously optimized to save power. Um, and, and the goal of this was, was kind of twofold. Obviously, we want to save you on your power bill. We don't want to burn the power. We don't have to cool it. But also from a sustainability standpoint, we don't want to have to emit the carbon of that energy that was consumed by the console. So by reducing the power in these surprisingly high usage modes, a lot of people watch videos on their Xbox, believe it or not, it's not just for gaming. Uh, we wanted to keep the power to a minimum so we can have a minimal carbon footprint. And with that, I'm going to toss it back to Andrew, and he's going to tell us about our power delivery network. Thanks, David. Uh, so. X, that Xbox sock that we've been talking about, Xbox Series X sock, uh, is the highest performing and the highest power one that we've ever had to deliver. And the key to that is the voltage regulator subsystem that delivers actual power to the, to the sock. In order to do that, we needed to squeeze uh, more power into a smaller space. And so this graph on the right shows just kind of a rough representation of the amount of power being delivered in watts per square inch of board area, or per millimeter squared. Um, and you can see that starting with the Xbox One X, that really that, that curve has a knee in it. We really started getting more dense. And that trend only intensified in the Xbox Series X generation. Uh, the key to that is that we, in starting with the Xbox One X, we went to the digital controller. So we use uh, dual and triple loop uh, digital voltage regulator controllers from MPS, meaning they control multiple ra rails at one time. And that's, that's not unusual. I'm certainly not the only one doing that. It's very standard in the industry these days. What is a little more unusual is that we really rely on the high, uh, the high accuracy telemetry uh, of the, that these provide. And we've worked with MPS to tune that down to where we're accurate both at high power and at very low power consumption so that we can really make these measurements accurately in real time. Um, so what that means is that for characterization and debug of the silicon, uh, for for looking at different titles, for manufacturing, for field performance, we can look across, you know, in, in, out in the field, how the consoles are actually being used, what, how much power are they consuming, and which titles, and what, what does that profile look like? We're able to gather all that information and really optimize uh, the power consumption, as David was mentioning. And as he mentioned, the key to that, really, for reducing our overall power usage, is the lower power states where the consoles actually spend a lot of their time. Uh, th this allows us to do that, and you can see at the picture below. Uh, kind of showing what an Xbox One S voltage regulator looks like compared to an Xbox Series X voltage regulator phase, one phase of the regulator. And it's about half the size that is delivering quite a bit more power per phase. So the actual power density is much, much higher. Um, the second part of the design there, or I should actually mention, uh, one of the other things that allows us to do it in manufacturing is to adjust each rail of each console, of each stock, so all the different voltages independently for that particular uh, Sock, so that we can optimize the power on a per console, per rail basis in, in across different power states and really deliver the lowest power console possible, still meeting the performance guides. Another thing that we do uh, in this design phase, and David talked about this with the, the X clamp, is we redesign the power distribution network underneath the sock. We optimize the capacitor placement and selection to, to reduce the voltage droop in these high power scenarios. And that really comes into play uh, in some of the early silicon development, because as we mentioned, we're designing this box months and years before the silicon is actually available. And that means that we really have to have it ready to go the day the silicon arrives so that the development on games can start. So that, that really helped us out in that regard. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Mark to talk about the storage solution. Thank you, Andrew. Storage was an area of significant innovation in the Xbox Series X. Uh, it starts with the uh, transition from a hard disk drive in the One X to a solid state drive. This, this allowed for a significant, uh, in fact, an order of magnitude increase in the raw bandwidth of the storage subsystem. 
In terms of system design, uh, this meant routing PCI Agent 4 to a solid state drive in an M.2 form factor. Another area of significant innovation was in the storage expansion card. This was designed in partnership with Seagate. What it allowed for was for a plug and play user expandable storage solution without an impact in game performance. It was tremendous work in system design, also allowing, um, also um, running PCIe essentially to a connector and to the storage um, card. And there's a significant amount of work in both electrical and mechanical and thermal design to make this all work. Uh, really great work from the storage team here. All these innovations uh, were the platform for things like Quick Resume and the Xbox Velocity architecture. I will now hand it over to Andrew to conclude the presentation. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we're running a little short on time, but we just wanted to kind of say thank you and to, to talk about what's something we're so proud of this console. So the Xbox Series X is the most powerful console we've ever made. There's a huge number of innovations that went into it, uh, not only from the hardware teams, from, from mechanical and electrical and, and, and industrial design and manufacturing and silicon, but also the software and firmware, all the content that's delivered. But I mean, the key takeaway from us is that this is something we're really excited about. We love building consoles. We love playing games. It's something we're very excited about. And uh, we spent years of our lives working on this. And now it's kind of up to the developers to go harness this power and really light up experiences for our Xbox gamers. And the hardware team is really excited to see what you come up with. So thanks for listening.